You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who art Ed? I'm trying to spice it. Who art Ed? Mr. Wood art Ed me. <laughs> yeah. Either way, it, it, can be, it works on so many levels. I know. That's off to a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and joining me today, I have Myrtle, the host of an upcoming podcast, The Series of Dysfunctional Events. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join me. No problem. I'm happy to do it. Oh, I was really happy to um, I was really happy to talk to you because one of my goals is to celebrate art in all of its forms. But I'm going to be honest, I am not a fibers guy. Like, oh, okay. I, I, I like a lot of different stuff. I respect it. But yeah. my my sewing skills are garbage. Oh, well. <laughs> everybody I, can learn. I, you would think everybody could learn. Uh. But I I had a sewing machine for the longest time. I tried. I, I, I can hand stitch a couple things. Like, you know, when I when I rip my clothing or whatever, or lose a sure. button, I can do it. It's ugly, but it, it, it functions. <laughs> but um, that is a skill that I just have never been able to to master. But I know that you are very much into quilting and fibers. Yes. And I grew so, up with that. Yeah, and I appreciate that you're lending that expertise and that experience because we're talking about Faith Ringgold, who yes. also grew up with fibers. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think she's amazing. I yeah, I I would definitely second that. But before we get into that, I do want to make sure because, you know, when somebody is generous enough to join me on my show, I want to make sure that I start off by plugging their pluggables. And as I said, you have your own podcast coming out. It's going to be starting on October 1st called A Series of Dysfunctional Events. I love the playoff, like the Lemony Snicket uh, series of unfortunate events. Um, But A Series of Dysfunctional Events will be out on your favorite podcast apps starting October 1st. And... Uh, listeners can learn more about your show on dysfunctionalevents.com. Is that right? That's right. That's right. I have a whole website there for people to contact me and get a hold of me. Yeah. And um, so I will definitely be listening to that as it comes out. And I will make sure that I leave you a rating or review on the podcast I, apps. I and I would encourage that. listeners to do the same because. Launching a podcast is a lot of work, and everybody who leaves ratings and reviews is doing something kind for others, and it costs you nothing. So please help your favorite podcasters leave a rating or review on whatever apps you're using. But now, sure. now we're going to get into Faith Ringgold. Yes. I was I was really interested in her story. You know, as an elementary art teacher, I first became aware of Tar Beach, the the you know, just as the picture book that we would put out that cuz you know, when you're teaching the younger kids, a picture book, a story always is so compelling. Yeah. And that's where I first learned about her. I I started to I started off uh seeing Tar Beach in other elementary classrooms probably from the time I was student teaching cuz it really hit in like 1990, but okay. we're going to go way back to the beginning here. Yeah. So she was born October 8th, 1930 in Harlem, New York. So like this was the time of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, jazz. She was, she, yeah, jazz. I mean, she she said she was like surrounded by a whole lot of stuff. But also at the same time, when we think of America in 1930, the Great Depression, yeah. You know, I mean, she grew up a child of the Depression. One thing I found really lovely, though, was she talked about how she grew up in the Depression, but she said that she was surrounded by and protected by her family. And I had know. like, I, I love that because I, I, I read so many stories and so many biographies that are informed by trauma. And certainly, yes. she has not had an easy life. There have been plenty of things that were were awful, you know, in right. the experience of, you know, growing up in, in 1930s and, yeah. you know, a, a black woman in, you know, that time period, that yeah. all sorts of all sorts yes. of stuff. But I love that she had a loving support system. 
I do too. I think that's what created her. I, it has to have helped because even the during the depression, it didn't seem to affect her. Her family helped her through that. Yeah. And that's great. Yeah. And her her family name at the time was Jones. She was born mm-hmm. Faith Jones. And her family came up to New York during the Great Migration. That was the time period um, where a lot, like especially in the Jim Crow South, a lot of um, a lot of African American families moved up from the South up to the North right. to get a little bit better treatment and better opportunities. Although still, a lot of the same struggles persisted. Yeah. Her mother was a fashion designer and seamstress. I guess she was pretty successful in in that vein. And I did see that. And obviously that would play out later on in in this story of Faith Ringgold and her mm-hmm. development as an artist. Her father worked a variety of jobs. I mean, in the 1930s, I think everybody was working a variety of jobs to make sure. ends meet. The household, though, because her mother was her mother was an artist. Her mother was a designer yeah. and a seamstress. And like I said, Harlem in New York at that time was a a really vibrant art scene. Um, yeah. She grew up in a household that encouraged her creativity, her creativity. And, yeah. you know, she was surrounded by artists. I mean, Langston Hughes and Duke Ellington were like, oh, can just you around imagine? The corner. I can't imagine. <laughs> I know. Um, like Sonny Rollins, uh, for listeners unfamiliar with jazz music, Sonny Rollins was, a. Uh, a well-known, a prominent jazz musician, but also like her childhood friend. So he would oh. come over and play the sax at parties and stuff like that. That would be great. It just it just sounds amazing. I it's cool to see these stories where so many creative, brilliant people seem to cross paths, and I don't think it's an accident. I think a lot of times these people who have that passion and that drive for the arts and for whatever field, they find each other and they support each other and they become great because of that interaction, I think. But yes, with supporting each other. It sounds like she had creativity all the way around her as a child and it really helped her to be creative. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I think helped her to be creative was she had asthma. And this reminds me of the story of... Um, who was the guy who created Garfield? Jim uh no. Davis? Yeah, Jim Davis. Yeah. He he also had asthma as a child and so like, you know, she's inside a lot. She's not yeah. running around so much like the air quality like it can irritate her. And so yeah. she's at home, she's drawing. Her mom gives her, you know, crayons and teaches her to she sew. She finds an outlet. Yeah. It's she it's found her an thing. Yeah. And I get that. And and I think that's beautiful. Like I said, her mom was encouraging her as well as teaching her her skills, passing it on through the family. Yep. That's how we create great artists, isn't we? Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's so the tough. ultimate apprenticeship. Yep. And so then, 1948, she enrolls in the City College of New York, and she wanted to major in art. But I guess at that time, and this is one of those things that just like makes my brain hurt. Me um, too. Women were only allowed to enroll in certain majors, so she got pushed into art education, um, right. which so much to unpack there. It's, you know. Thank God it's changed. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can't imagine. Well, it's like it's not only disrespecting women as as learners capable of tackling any subject that they they choose and want to dedicate right. themselves but also it's it's putting education in this lesser category as well you know oh yeah i get what you're saying um, the two are important yeah it kind of matters who's yeah. in that classroom and leading <laughs> it, it. Sure um, or at least i like to think so yeah definitely <laughs> uh so then she started there in 1948, 1950. She's married. She's married to a jazz musician. She has two kids. They divorced after just a few years because of a substance abuse disorder. Uh, at at that time, you know, she's meeting different artists. She, like I said, she's married to a jazz musician. Obviously, she's gonna be in that scene. Yeah. Um, 
and I know all of them. Yeah, and she continues to study and she continues to grow in her practice. One of the things I found really interesting, though, when I think of like the the mid to late twentieth century, you know, I, I'm picturing the civil rights movement, the feminist movement. But one of the things that, again, just really disappointing is the the civil rights movement, you know, and a lot of those movements around black empowerment were often focused on black men and the the women's liberation the feminist movement was often focused on white women and faith ringgold as a black woman was not always getting the support that other people were getting as as people were reaching for equality and so one thing i found really cool was in i think it was 1970s she actually formed an artist collective specifically focused on trying to lift up and empower black women artists. I had read that about her. I think that's awesome. I, I think it, you know, it's, it's absolutely beautiful that like she's not finding the support system that she felt like she needed at that time. It's there's, there's a vacuum for that kind of thing. And yeah. and she fills the void. She steps in and steps up to not only help herself, but to help other people in that situation. Yeah. The art was her voice. The art gave her a voice all through, didn't it? And she just kept doing it. She just kept doing it. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I mean, so many, so many of these artists' stories are all about the persistence and Mm -hmm. the resilience of the artist. Um, After college, you know, she teaches for a while, She goes on to get her master's in education. She travels through Europe. 1961, she comes back uh, when her brother passed away. 1962 is where she gets the name Ringgold. She married uh, Burdette Ringgold. And like I said, in the 70s, 1973 is when she quit teaching to focus specifically on art making as her full-time job. And she started off. She started off kind of painting. I look at her earlier works in the, the painting and I, I see a lot of similarity to like Jacob Lawrence in the style. Mm-hmm. There's like there's a sort of flatness to the stylization. Uh, kind of primitive. Or, yeah. It, I, I I always I struggle to describe it because it, it feels it feels flat. It feels almost like like um like synthetic cubism almost. Oh um, yeah. yeah. You know, I there's like that. There's this simplicity to mm-hmm. to the rendering that I always look at that that sort of raw aesthetic that feels almost like it could be an untrained artist or a self-taught artist as trying to tap into something that is just deep and innate. And because, you know, when when it feels overly polished, it feels studied, it feels less expressive in some ways, less authentic, maybe. Yeah, less authentic. And her her earlier works, you know, she's tackling she's tackling a lot of issues of social justice. She's focusing on political issues. And I think you know, she said in the 1960s, you know, she's explaining her American People series saying, "I couldn't act like everything was okay. I couldn't paint landscapes in the 60s. There's just too much going on." I'm proud Which, of her for that. It it takes courage. It sure absolutely does. takes courage to speak up um, and and share your experience when your experience is not so great. But she she didn't dwell in the negativity. She took action, yes. and eventually she shifted away from sort of painting tw- more towards quilts. Although she still like paints on the quilts. Yes. Um. But her fiber art is awesome. Her fiber art is awesome. And that's what she's really best known for. And I think even the choice of the quilt is in some ways a political statement. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily think of it in that way. I but hadn't. but like when you think about it, she shifted towards a traditionally overlooked material. You know? Yep. I mean Quilts have been have been made by traditionally women 
for the yes. longest time. And they were traditionally written off as a craft, as a functional object, and not viewed through that lens of fine art. Except amongst the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and and I'm not to say I, I didn't want to say that nobody viewed or respected right. it, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yes, there weren't a lot of galleries and museums clamoring to get the great quilts. No, it, it was all about the paintings and the bronzes and the marbles. And mm-hmm. and she she consciously chose that medium because of its rich tradition in, um, you know, as an art form for women, but also the personal connection with her own family. You know, she yes. talked about how she learned from her mother and her grandmother, and she was continuing the methods that she learned from them. And I think that's great that they helped her with that to express herself however she felt the need. Yes. And I also thought it was interesting. I did not realize this until I was doing a little bit more research. So Faith Ringgold, she started off on quilts she's wanting to tell a story you know Uh she's making these story quilts Uh which i I knew about that obviously but i didn't realize that she was doing the stories on the quilts because she couldn't get published oh yeah she was trying to she was trying to write her story and tell her story and put out her autobiography and like none of the publishers would touch it no and she said that what she did was she started putting the story on the quilt because then when it went up in the gallery wall, so many people in the gallery space would see it and then it would be photographed for magazines, periodicals, sometimes in art books, and it would be published in that way. And her stories had an impact that way because she used a different way to get it out there. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And so she was successful in creating an audience for her stories because eventually she did get published. She did did get not only Tar Beach, she has written and illustrated 17 children's books. I didn't realize it was that many. Yeah, it's it's quite a few. Um, The most famous of those books was Tar Beach. Mm -hmm. Um, The book was published in 1991 based on the quilt of the same name that she created in 1990. And so after the break, we're going to talk about that specific work, Tar Beach. Here we are. We're looking at Tar Beach. Um, This was the first and probably most famous story quilt created by Faith Ringgold. I think it's at the Guggenheim. Yes. Um, And just as we're looking at this, what are you seeing? What's jumping out at you? The kids laying there really relaxed, having a great time looking at the stars. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the kids laying out on, I guess, you know, the story of Tar Beach, I should probably give the the quick overview for those who aren't familiar. And I will link to the story in the show notes for this episode. But the story of Tar Beach is, you know, the Tar Beach she's talking about is on the rooftop in, in the building, like thinking about kids in the city. They don't go to a literal beach. They've got the tar beach on the roof. And she's talking about her sort of fantasies of flying over the city and claiming things, flying over buildings and bridges and things like that. And as she flies over them, she claims them and they become hers. That's neat. Um, And so it's that sort of childhood daydreaming type fantasy. And yeah, the the kids laying out on that stark white blanket. Uh-huh. That certainly grabs my attention as well. Immediately. She did a good job getting your attention there. And I think one of the things that's interesting about that as I'm looking at it, and maybe this is just me, but the blanket that they're laying on has like a floral border that kind of reminds me of the border of the Tar Beach quilt. I bet you it's the same. You know, like I yep, I wonder if right. that's I wonder if that's meant to be sort of a it definitely um, matches color wise. I wonder if that's meant to be sort of a meta reference within the work. 
could be and the whole she's got the whole story written out in white at the bottom of the quilt which is amazing yes she did she wrote out the story across the bottom and the top and and as i'm looking mm-hmm. at it there's there's this sort of patchwork of floral prints that frame like little squares of different floral things that are framing it um that seem to make a patterned border and then in the center square we have essentially painted fabric yeah that is illustrating uh the central scene of the entire story with the adults sitting at a table on the rooftop while the kids are laying out on on a blanket um, they've just had a picnic yeah it just seems like a picnic it seems like it's probably a hot summer day Maybe you don't have air conditioning. Trying I to bet find, she didn't. <laughs> you know, um, as as I'm looking at this though, I'm wondering about the construction of it. it. Is this the kind of thing where would you paint the fabric first, or would you quilt it then paint it? You would paint it first and then quilt through it. That's the normal routine with quilting okay. on fabric art and paint going together. Yeah, okay. she quilted it down afterwards. She probably used a clear monofilament thread so it didn't show on yeah. the paint. Yeah, because I can see like I can see essentially like indentations where the stitched mm-hmm. lines would be, but I don't see the thread itself, which I was curious about. Would it have been sewn through the back of it somehow? Or you're saying it's just a clear thread that goes through? I'm thinking it's a clear thread that goes through it so it doesn't disrupt the picture at all. It just quilted it down. Yeah. That's what I'd have done if I was making something like that. It's interesting. And I think it's kind of cool the way that, like, you can see so much happening in here. It's like you... And I see the repetition of the little girl on the blanket and then that same little girl flying through the sky. Yeah. So we get to see like the real and the fantasy simultaneously, which I think. It's neat. It's it's an interesting way of portraying it. Yeah, Um, because she's looking back down on herself and looking at herself. It's really cool the way that worked. Yeah. And as I as I look at this. um. I'm I'm just struck by the the colors. I see these different remnants of fabrics. It's funny. It's like borders upon borders upon borders to it. I wonder. Yes, why she's definitely be. done a lot of piecing on the border. Yeah, and I wonder why why that would be. I wonder if in some ways it just makes more of a connection to that tradition of like patched fabric. Probably. I'd say that is a statement on making do with what you have. Yeah, that's a good point. It it has this remnant feel to it because there are so many different mm-hmm. bits to it. Well, and these kids are making do with their tar beach because they don't have grass in a park to run in. And so she made the border make do also. Yeah. I I think yeah there probably there there is some sort of unification to that um that reinforces sort of that that central that central feeling or central tone to it of you know taking what you've got and making it into something Life even gives greater. you lemons yeah. make the lemonade <laughs> Yeah, in some ways. And I think, you know, taking that functional object and elevating it and finding a way to get your voice heard and your story out there, like all of that seems to be encompassed in this one work, isn't it? Thank you, because I was I was trying so hard not to say it's, it's all in, of those different threads stitched together in it here. Is. <laughs> and it's such a personal statement. I I admire her uh willingness to share you know her personal that's her story she's sharing with you there yeah it's interesting because it's it's personal and somehow universal at the same time yes yes because everybody's been there and i think that's that's a tough line to that's a tough line to walk sure is sure is she's a brave woman for as far as i'm concerned 
It certainly is. And, you know, the other thing I don't think we even talked about, one of the things that I, I read about why she was doing the quilts on or why she was making the work on quilts. Another reason, aside from like the the cultural and family traditions that she's carrying on right. and elevating a marginalized art form, it was also she wanted something that she could handle herself. It wasn't a big, heavy canvas that yeah. she would need someone else to pick up and transport. It was something that she could easily roll up and bring into the gallery herself. That's um, a good a thought. And so I, I think it's kind of cool that she's also finding ways to just, you know, navigate that and and become in, you know, assert her independence in her in her work. Well, and I'm absolutely certain her doing her art form in quilts with fabric helped to elevate other women who make art quilts because she did it at an early time. She did. I feel like in some ways this is like the this laid the foundation for artists like Bisa Butler, who today is doing just jaw dropping work. Wow. Out of quilts. I mean, if you've seen her work, I, I did an, not. I did an episode on on her maybe a year ago or something. But, it, you know, she is making just stunning work that Feels like it's painted, although she is taking just different colored remnants of fabric and all sorts of different colors and stitches them together to create the shapes of different colors. So it's not like she's painting paint by right number here. kind of thing. It it is fabric. almost it is almost like that. It's like you know because she is another artist who is trained as a painter, but she would do like okay, this is the way I would paint it with these shapes of different colors and stuff like that. And then she takes fabric and cuts it to those different shapes for each of the color separations and um, does time layers consuming, and layers. very time consuming and very much above my skill level, and my, my level of expertise in, yeah. in fibers. Like I, I was going to say, I can sew, but I haven't quite gotten that far yet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's not just the sewing. You just think of like the cutting skills. Oh, to, like, that's get what all, takes you know, the it's, time. It's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I guess we should probably get back to Tar Beach here. As I'm looking at it, I find it interesting, the composition. She did actually more than one version of Tar Beach. This one we're looking at is number one, which is focused a lot on that rooftop. And yeah. then in number two, she does more where we see like the skyline more prominently. I'm every time I look at this, I'm a little conflicted because on the one hand, I like the emphasis of like the rooftop and everything like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, there's so little of the sky, and I feel like the story is so much about that elevation and going into the sky and the fantasy of flying. Kind of wish I saw, I wish I saw a more vast sky in here. I, I get that too because that'd be more part of the story. Yeah, and I, I guess I I guess that wish is fulfilled in in Tar Beach too, which is a little bit. It feels a little bit more sort of fantasy here. I'm I also actually see, didn't go. know there was two versions of that. Oh yeah, yeah. There's there's more than one. I can send you a link to number two here i think it's like a lot of artists once they find you know what's working and what's resonating with yeah. people it's like they go oh, with that well you got to play the hits you know yeah oh i do like that one i like that one a lot better because it does have more of the sky scene going on more of the imagination well I, yeah, I think that's interesting. I think the brightness of the colors in Tar Beach 2, like Tar Beach 1 feels much more like it's much more muted. Muted and older. And and it feels it feels more true to what the city looks like, you know? Yeah. But when you look at Tar Beach 2, it feels more to me like a kid's view 
of things being a little bit brighter. And yes, there are the the gray drab elements, but like the the reds and yellows in Tar Beach too, it's like primary colored brightness. Um, There's more of a childish whimsy to this one. Yeah, which to me just it it feels more fun. I yes. I I like that child's viewpoint, especially on something that is supposed to be about that child's viewpoint. Yeah, it works well. And I like the way that the text Well, actually I'm conflicted about the text because on the one hand in Tar Beach 2, we see the text is sort of spread throughout the composition. Right. We see it's integrated into that picture. We see the story and picture together. In Tar Beach 1, the story is laid out within the border at the top and the bottom. And that makes it a little easier to read and easier to follow. Yeah. But it's separated. It's, you know, like you look at the picture and then you look at the text. Whereas here, you're kind of doing both at the same time a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. They're scattered throughout the sky like that. I I like that, though. I think that makes it more interesting. So between the two, I guess this is a question I've never really asked asked my my guests, but because we've got two versions of Tar Beach here, you know, I, I do wonder, which do you feel is the more successful overall? I would think her first one probably was. You like the first one? Mm-hmm. I like the rendering of the figures in the first one. They feel a little mm-hmm. bit more. The skyline looks pretty realistic too. Yeah. And I, I like the rooftop composition for the first one. Mm-hmm. I like the feel of the second one overall. I get that though. Believe me. But there's, yeah. You just like the mood of the second one better, don't you? Well, I think I think I like a couple of things. I like the way that just from a compositional standpoint, I like the angle of the bridge. I like the balance of it with more of the sky being visible and the figures flying through the sky being more prominent. Yeah. Um as as a grown man with the mind of a child, mm-hmm. I like the brightness of the color and the way that those bright colors are distributed because there are pops of yellows that are nicely, nicely spread across the composition to balance it. And the, the rooftop becomes this triangular wedge that points my eye up at the true like focus of this story of the, the figures flying in the sky. Like it we understand works to do that. Yeah. The, the, di- the triangle. Yeah. Because like we have the big triangle of that rooftop, which is it's pulling my attention. Like I understand that has a certain amount of visual weight that grabs my attention. I understand that's one key focal point. And then it also, because it's triangular, it's an arrow pointing me up at uh-huh. the counterbalancing equally important, if not arguably more important of the fantasy. Um, and I, I think there's something really nice about that at the same yeah. time. Like the, the first version feels a little bit more sophisticated in a lot of ways. I'm yeah. conflicted, but I, I think I probably go with number two. Well, we could differ on that one. Can't we? <laughs> I think I think there's room to to respectfully disagree on stuff. Yeah, there is. Especially <laughs> stuff that's just a simple matter of opinion and personal exactly. taste. Exactly. Yes, everyone has those. And I'm wrapping it up. I want a- just a 3-point rating scale. And where should this hang? The Louvre? Is this something to look at? The lab? the lab? Is this something to learn from? Or the loop? British for the bathroom. Yeah, there's a the loop loop. joke in there somewhere. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. Where do you think this piece belongs? I think that it belongs in the Louvre because it makes such a statement. And she was brave enough to speak out at a time when women were supposed to be seen and not heard. And I just think it makes an important statement. And I think it needs to go in the Louvre. Yeah, I... 
I, I can't really argue against that point. I mean, her her work has so much that is not only like strong visually because like it's it's pleasant to look at, yes. you know, um, like when I think of a museum piece, I want it to work on a couple of levels. And I agree this one. It's nice to look at either version. I I. I struggle to de- to decide which one I yeah. like better because they're both good in different ways, but they're both pleasing to look at. And I also think, like you said, this hits at a couple of different levels of significance for her personally and culturally, you know, just to bring this full circle at the very beginning, she was saying how she grew up in the depression, but she wasn't she wasn't hindered by it because she had that loving, supportive family. And we see here in, in tar beach, she is surrounded by those people that she loves. And she's putting that out on a quilt, which also the, the other thing that I absolutely love about the connection of the quilt as a medium is the quilt is, it's a symbol of security. It is warmth. It is safety. It is that comfort. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, when you're feeling sick, you seek the comfort of a quilt. So when you're, you know, like you're wrapped up. And so she's creating something that is warm and cozy in terms of the narrative, but also the material that she's laying it out on. And I think that is something that is beautiful that we can relate to in any number of different ways. That is powerful. She put it on a medium that creates security and comfort like her family gave her. Yeah. And she's she's passing it on to the rest of us to That's see right. and appreciate. And um I I do love that. And I think I that's too. why it deserves its its place in the museum and it's why so many thousands, if not millions, of people have enjoyed the story of Tar yes. Beach. Yes. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me about Faith Ringgold and Tar Beach. Um, once again, Myrtle from a series of dysfunctional events. Check it out in your podcast app starting October 1st. Thank you for having me. I've had a great time. Well, thank you. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.